Okay, so what are we going to learn in ES4? Now, the thing that gets me excited about ES4 in particular is that from your past courses or courses that you're taking concurrently, um, you've got circuits, so from physics and ES3 or EE20, you understand how electrons move around in a circuit and how to wire up circuits to perform various functions. And then on the other side, you've taken Comp11 or ES2, you have some experience with programming, you know how to write code to make a computer do something. But then there's this huge gap in between, like, okay, so I write code, but like, what is, and clearly computers use electricity, but, but how? Well, like, what, what's going on between my code and the circuits that actually makes all of this work? And that's the gap that ES4 fills in. So that whole space in there is called digital design. So how do we take basic circuit components and then arrange them to compute basic math, uh, arrange them to keep track of memory, arrange them to store values in different places, to move values around, and then ultimately how do we execute code that's been written? I should add, there's a couple other courses, so Comp40, uh, Comp 126 uh, operating systems also fill in some of those gaps, uh, but ES4 is gonna fill in one huge gap in between ES3 and physics and programming. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do, but why should you care? Uh, besides the obvious fact that it's probably required uh, for your computer science or electrical and computer engineering degree, why should you care about taking ES4? So let me give you one example, and that's Bitcoin. So you'll hear about Bitcoin in the news every few months as the price of Bitcoin goes up or crashes or whatever. But fundamentally, Bitcoin is working because there are a huge number of computers doing massive computations in the back end. In fact, being computationally as expensive is part of what makes Bitcoin work the way it does. If it was easy to do the computations, then somebody could take over and gain the majority of the computing power and then therefore control uh, the Bitcoin ledger. Okay, so there's, there's massive computations going on just to keep Bitcoin running. And if you, you get paid for your share of those computations as you perform, or if you, if you perform the computation uh, that creates the, the, the magic number, basically you, you find the magic number that completes this block in the blockchain, uh, then you get rewarded with some Bitcoin. And so there was a incentive Basically, you're converting electricity, you're running your computer, converting electricity into Bitcoin. And so clearly the amount of money you can make doing this is based on how much, how efficient you are at converting electricity into Bitcoin. How much computation can you do for a given unit of electricity? And so when Bitcoin first started, people were mining Bitcoin on CPUs. Uh -huh. And we'll, we'll quantify this in how much computation you can do is in hashes per second. So hash is a particular operation on the blockchain. CPU, um, maybe a hundred million hashes per second. Um, if you got a GPU, you could do over a thousand, over, um, if you got a GPU, you could do a giga hash per second, so over a billion hashes per second. In FPGA, you can't do as many hashes Per second, so an FPGA is a particular programmable logic device that we're going to use a lot in this course. So the FPGA can do, say, one example I found was 500 million hashes per second. And when you think, well, okay, the GPU is made clearly a better choice, um, but not so. So the, the FPGA, what well, doesn't run as fast, but it also uses much, much less power. So whereas a GPU can compute the giga hash per second at about a thousand watts, the FPGA is running with much, much less power and ultimately has about 10 times as many hashes per joule of energy. And so the end result is, since I'm converting energy, electricity into Bitcoin, that I can just buy more FPGAs, run them, and for the same amount of electricity, I can do a lot more hashes and hopefully learn, earn a lot more Bitcoin. But even past FPGAs, if I design my own custom silicon chip, uh, this is known as an application-specific IC, so or ASIC. If I design my own custom chip, 
I can blow everything else out of the water completely um, and get orders you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 times more performance per watt or more hashes per joule of energy than could be done with a CPU or a GPU or even an FPGA. Well, you know, how do you design your own FPGA design or how do you design your own ASIC? Well, that's, that's digital design and that's what we're going to learn in this course. This kind of power constraint occurs in so many other places. So wearable devices. So if you're going to make a smart watch or a smart ring or a pacemaker or some other device that's got to run on a battery for days or months or years, has to be extremely frugal with its power. You're not going to do this by just grabbing any random processor off the shelf and writing code for it. Uh, neural network hardware, again, especially if you want to run it on a mobile device or in the, um, on the edge um, in some kind of Internet of Things application, being able to run at extremely low power and get high performance is, is critical. Network routers, for example, if you're going to run a you know, hundred gigabit Ethernet, that's a lot of packets moving really fast. Now you have to analyze a packet, you're running some kind of network filter, you've got to do that extremely quickly, and even a very, very fast processor is not able to do that unless it's a custom design processor for that task. Doing things like gene matching, so taking whole genomes and searching for particular sequences. Um, again, sure, you can program CPUs to do this, um, but the quantity of data in a human genome is enormous. And so to be able to do this at scale, again, requires specialized hardware that works much faster or much more efficiently than traditional CPUs. And then any kind of big data analytics, um, whenever you've got enormous quantities of data, it's often going to be more practical to use some kind of customized hardware to process that data than it is to just use CPUs. Now you say, well, I'm just going to write you know, Node.js code or something that runs on a big data center, and I, like, I don't really care about any of these applications. Um, but even in the data center, uh, custom hardware is now everywhere. So Google's had their tensor processing units out for five-ish years. Um, Microsoft has had a research project called Catapult and now has the Intel FPGA cloud. So if you, you can get an Azure cloud set up with FPGAs in the server, in the, in the server cloud infrastructure. Uh, same thing with Amazon EC2. You, you can get uh, F1 cloud instances, which again have an FPGA in the server architecture on, on the cloud. So more and more, we're seeing specialized hardware um, moving into large data centers. And again, performance per watt, the amount of computation you can do for a certain amount of energy is the primary dictator of what your actual performance is. Uh, these days, even data centers are limited by how much electricity you can put in and how much heat you can get out. So if you can do some computation for half the energy and therefore produce half as much heat coming out, you can do twice as much computation in your data center. Okay, you say, so like this is important for some people, but like, what about me? I want a job. Well, there's jobs. Uh, so I did a search. I, there's, there's jobs at Apple, there's jobs at Facebook, there's jobs at Google. Um, there are lots of jobs designing digital hardware at all different levels. Okay, so the, the rough breakdown of this course we're going to spend the first third of the course or so talking about combinational logic. So this is sets of logic gates that, given some particular set of inputs, are then going to produce a particular set of outputs. In the second piece of the course, we'll start talking about FPGAs. So an FPGA is a field programmable gate array, which is a chip that includes this huge sea of logic gates with reconfigurable wiring. And by configuring that wiring, we can then produce logic designs of all sorts of different types and create things that would be of, of a scale and, and with speed that would just be very difficult to wire up ourselves, um, while also not requiring that we go design our own custom silicon and have someone fabricate that in a, in a chip fab. 
Then we're going to learn a language. Uh, it's not a programming language. It's a hardware description language, but it, it looks and feels like programming. Uh, it's called VHDL, and it's going to be sort of our power tool for working with FPGAs. So having mastered combinational logic and VHDL and FPGAs, we'll move into sequential logic, which is circuits that can remember their current state and do things based on that state. So whereas combinational logic always has a fixed set of inputs that always produce a, a fixed set of outputs, combinational logic, we can build things like counters uh, that can keep track of where they currently are. And state machines that move around uh, keep track of states in, in more complex ways. And then finally, we're going to put all these building blocks together and talk about how we actually build a computer from the ground up. So we'll talk about building memories. We'll talk about building registers, um, building counters to keep track of which instruction we're at, and decoders and mathematical units. We'll put all of those pieces together to actually build a processor that can run a small subset of the ARM instruction set that powers your phone and all sorts of other devices. So that's our game plan for the course. Um, go ahead and read the textbook and watch the rest of the videos for this week, and we'll get things underway.